The strange quartet, he fluttering to the ground, she puzzled by the sudden ugliness, Ronnie fumbling, the Brahmin observing all three, but with downcast eyes and hands folded, as if nothing was noticeable. A scene from a play, thought Fielding, who now saw them from the distance across the garden, grouped among the blue pillars of his beautiful hall. Don't trouble to come, mother, Ronnie called. We're just starting. He hurried to Fielding, drew him aside, and said with pseudo-hardiness, I say, old man, do excuse me, but I think perhaps you oughtn't to have left Miss Quested alone. I'm sorry, what's up? replied Fielding, also trying to be genial. Well, I'm the sun-dried bureaucrat, no doubt. Still, I don't like to see an English girl left smoking with two Indians. She stopped as she smokes by her own wish, old man. Yes, that's all right in England. I really can't see the harm. If you can't see, you can't see. Can't you see the fellow's a bounder? Aziz Swimboyant was patronizing Mrs. Moore. He isn't a bounder, protested Fielding. His nerves are on his nerves are on edge, that's all. What should have his, what should have upset his precious nerves? I don't know. He was all right when I left. Well, it's nothing I've said, said Ronnie reassuringly. I never even spoke to him. Oh well, come along now and take your ladies away, the catastrophe over. Fielding, don't think I'm taking it badly or anything of that sort. I suppose you won't come on with you won't come on to Polo with us. We should be all, we should all be delighted. I'm afraid I can't. Thanks all the same. I'm awfully sorry you feel I've been remiss. I didn't mean to be. So the leave taking began. Everyone was cross or wretched. It was as if irritation exuded from the very soil. Could one have been so petty on an on a Scottish on a Scotch moor or an Italian Alp? Fielding wondered afterwards, there seemed to no reserve of tranquility to draw upon in India. Either none, or else tranquility swallowed up everything, as it appeared to do for Professor Godwell. Here was Aziz, Aziz, all shoddy and odious, Mrs. Moore and Miss Quested, both silly, and he himself and Hazlip, both decorous on the surface, but detestable, really, detesting each other. Goodbye, Mr. Fielding, Fielding and thank you so much. What lovely college buildings. Goodbye, Mrs. Moore. Goodbye, Mr. Fielding. Such an interesting afternoon. Goodbye, Miss Quested. Goodbye, Aziz. Goodbye, Mrs. Moore. Goodbye, Aziz. Goodbye, Miss Quested. He pumped her hand up and down to show that he felt at ease. You're jolly, jolly well not forget these, those caves, won't you? I'll fix the whole thing up in a jiffy. Thank you. Inspired by the devil to a final effort, he added, What a shame you leave India so soon. Oh, do reconsider your decision to stay. Goodbye, Professor Godwell, she continued, suddenly agitated. It's a shame we never heard you sing. Uh, I may sing now, he replied, and did. His thin voice rose and gave out one sound after another. At times there seemed rhythm, at times there was illusion of a western melody, but the ear, baffled repeatedly, soon lost any clue and wandered into a maze of noises, none harsh or unpleasant, none intelligible. It was the song of an unknown bird. Only the servants understood it. They began to whisper to one another. The man who was gathering water chestnut came naked out of the tank. His lips parted with delight, disclosing his scarlet tongue. The sounds continued and ceased after a few moments as casually as they had begun, apparently half through a bar and upon subdominant. Thanks so much. What was that? asked Fielding. I will explain in detail. It was a religious song. I placed myself in the position of a milkmaiden. I say to Sri, Sri Krishna, Come, come to me only. The god refused to come. I grew humble and say, Do not come to me only. Multiply it into a hundred Krishnas, and let one go to each of my hundred companions. But one, O Lord of the universe, come to me. He refuses to come. This is repeated several times. The song is composed in a rag, uh, appropriate to the present hour, which is the evening. But he comes in some other song, I hope, said Miss More gen Mrs. More gently. Oh no, he refuses to come, repeated Godwell perhaps not understanding her question. I say to him, come, 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 come. He neglects to come. Ronnie's step had died away, and there was a moment of absolute silence. No ripple disturbed the water, no leaf stirred. And next up we have Katie Pioli. Please give her a round of applause.
one's not mine, but it's it's a poem that I really I don't know. It got to me emotionally. Maybe because it's about a toad, and I love toads. But I'm just gonna read it. Maybe you guys will feel something moved. It's called "The Death of a Toad" by Richard Wilbur. A toad, the power mower caught, chewed and clipped off a leg with a hobbling hop has got to the garden verge and sanctuaried him under the cineraria leaves in the shade of the ashen and heart-shaped leaves in a dim, low, and final glade. The rare original heart's blood goes, spends in the earth and hide, in the folds and wizenings, flows in the gutters of the banked and staring eyes. He lies as still as if he would return to stone and soundlessly attending dies toward some deep monotone, toward misted and ebullient seas and cooling shores, toward lost amphibia's emperies. Day dwindles, drowning, and at length is gone in the wide and antique eyes which still appear to watch across the castrate lawn the haggard daylight here. And next up we have Zach Falls. Please give him a round of applause. Right. Um, I'm just going to do a little something I did, or I wrote on my own. Uh, it's about death. <laughs> More of it, I know, but... I've of, often wondered what exactly is death. Someone once explained it to me as the stopping of the heart, the mind, the brain, where when you die, you go to heaven. That is if you're faithful. But I stopped and pondered. What truly is death? I've heard it described as when your soul can no longer speak. Can, when your words no longer reach the people you want. You are no longer able to express what you think, you feel, to just communicate. I've heard it as not being able to hear the sounds of music or just anything, to live a life pure void of emotional expression. But I truly wonder if that's death. So I've deprived myself of that. I thought, okay, I'll sit in silence. I'll cut myself off. Yeah, I did not find death. Okay, what if you lived without a soul? A lot of people say you have no soul, you're living in death. Then I lived deprived. I lived that life of sin. Still, I didn't find death. I walked a long time. I mean, heck, I tried summoning death, I tried beckoning him. Come and take me. Let me meet you. Just once. That's all I need. Yeah, he didn't come. So I wonder, what truly is death? Is it growing old, not being able to do what you love? Stopping, becoming comatose? Not being able to think? Is it when your heart stops and when your body just can't move? Or is it when you stop thinking? Stop being able to create ideas and just sit there and accept life as it goes on. I could never come to a conclusion because I think it's too different for everyone. So I challenge you, what to you is death? And is it truly as bad as you think? Thank you.